Well, welcome back to Asteroid Day. And if, there are one, if there's one thing that we're learning here, it's that asteroids are no respecters of national boundaries. And that's what we're going to discuss here in this panel for the next 15 minutes or so. And the, it's the need for there to be a global response all of humankind coming together to look at this problem because we're all in this together. Now, Rusty, we've had a number of astronauts here today. On this panel, you are the only one, which means you have the unique perspective <laughs> of seeing the world from above. And I believe that that led you to um, want to talk and collaborate with other astronauts and led you to develop a unique organization. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. When you're flying around the Earth and looking down, uh, you know, with your eyes, uh, with rare exception, you don't see any of those boundaries. Um, it's interesting to think about asteroids looking down or at the Earth as they're approaching the Earth, and they don't see any boundaries either. And um, I, I want to try to get across in, in a few words here to people uh, why it is that, in fact, we're not going to know where an asteroid is going to hit before it hits. We're going to know approximately where it's going to hit. But the reason is a combination of the nature of telescopes and the nature of orbits. Um, if you think about using a telescope, uh, the average person thinks you can make wonderful measurements, and indeed you can. But in fact, what we're seeing out there when you really get right down to it is a small blob. You know, it's not a, p a perfect point. It's a small blob of light. And um, that blob means that we're not exactly sure where that asteroid is, but we're pretty sure. Over time, that blob begins to stretch out along the orbit of the asteroid so that, in fact, if we project ahead a year, two years, five years, that little blob has now elongated into a line along the orbit of that asteroid. And so when we look 20 years out and we say this asteroid is going to hit the Earth or might hit the Earth, um, you know, instead of it being a point on the Earth, what we've got is a line across the Earth. And depending upon how much tracking we've had on it, how, much, how, how many years we've been tracking an asteroid, that line can be a few hundred or a few thousand kilometers long, or it may be several times longer than the width of the Earth. So when at the, the irony here, in terms of thinking about uh, uh, the risk, is that at the time that we may have to make the decision to commit a mission to go up and deflect an asteroid, we don't know where on the Earth it's going to hit. If you think of a circle, the Earth, and a line all the way across it, if the asteroid's going to hit the Earth, it will hit somewhere on that line. Now, make a real map on that. Now, don't make that a, a bare circle, a sterile circle. Make it a globe and turn it any way you want. And that line may cross 20 countries or more or fewer, but many countries. And at the time that we're going to decide to deflect, we don't even know which country is really going to get hit. Maybe in the middle of the line, a little higher probability. But that's the reality that we're facing. So asteroids are no respecters of national boundaries, for yeah. sure. So that's the, that's the sort of the overview perspective from, uh, the, from the astronaut. Um, but Mark, you have been on the chair, you have been the chair of the Asteroid Day Expert Panel. And your job is to try to help stimulate the general population um, to understand and get behind um, support for, these, uh, for this problem. That's right, and, and I should say I, I took over that position from Rusty. Um, Rusty and I put together um, the expert panel. There are now 16 of us that are members of the expert panel, and the, and the real job is, is not to um, promote anything. It's really just to, to keep the discussion um, scientifically accurate, um, to, to make sure that everything go, that goes out of Asteroid Day, every question we answer is scientifically accurate to, to the best of our knowledge. Now, of course, 
there is uncertainty. There's always uncertainty in everything we do. And, and Rusty just pointed out, you know, this this line um, is an expression of uncertainty. The asteroid knows where it's going. It is going to hit one of those spots. It's it, there's a bullseye in there somewhere, a crosshairs. We just don't know which one of those points is, is the crosshairs. So we often use uh, the language of probability. So, so we recruited um, a number of experts, and and because the you know we don't respect international boundaries when it comes to scientific expertise, we've got people from all over the world on the panel. We've got a very uh, diverse. Um, international panel, diverse in terms of expertise and, and, and diverse in terms of, of um, you know, nation and also perspective. And we don't all agree with one another on everything. And we try to be honest about our disagreements, but we do get questions and we answer those to the best of our ability. And we also try to, when, when sometimes the media get a little bit ahead of themselves on stories, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> um, as I'm sure everyone has noticed, um, asteroids are something that I think some people refer to as clickbait. There are clickbait stories where you know, somebody will put something in a headline that may actually be based on an element, a grain of truth. NASA discovers an asteroid, but of course, you know, some unscrupulous media outlets will say, well, it's going to hit the Earth, even though the probability may be negligible. And, and we try to correct that and, and really explain, no, this is an extremely low probability. It will almost certainly go away. Um, there are also reports of events around the world that are attributed to impacts. And, and we look at those and say, you know, there's really no evidence that that was an impact event. It was, it was something else. Mm. And this is a very interesting point about um, maintaining the quality and the scientific accuracy of the information that comes out of Asteroid Day. Um, and from my position, with my, my training as an astronomer um, and journalist by profession, it, it, it is such a tightrope um, to walk that line of having an important story um, that you want to be widely read um, and, and fighting to keep um, things accurate um, without uh, uh, even unintentionally succumbing to um, sort of bigging them up. That's right. I, I mean, it is a fine line. Um, asteroids by themselves are exciting. That's why we're here. I mean, we're all very interested. And, and part of the excitement is the danger. I mean, they are dangerous. They wiped out the dinosaurs. And there is a danger to us. We want to we wanna make sure that that danger goes away. That's, that's part of it. But 99.999% of asteroids are, are not dangerous. They're the good guys. And we're also interested in those. Yes. Now, Julia, on the subject of um, the press, you've had some experience there as well, haven't you? Yes. Uh, th this is only my personal opinion. And uh, it's based on my own experience with the, with the media. And I have like a positive feeling, even if the headline is a sensationalist or alarming or whatever, you know, or, or maybe because of that, you, you catch the attention of the general public. And that's what we want. And that gives us, the scientists, the opportunity to share our message, to explain things properly, and, and, to, and to share our interest in, in, in the in asteroids and, and why is it so important to study them. So I have a positive feeling, so. Mm -hmm. I remember one um, story that, uh, that I wrote. I thought I, was, uh, I thought I was bulletproof with it because uh, I had um, I'd used the term potentially hazardous asteroid which, uh, or potentially hazardous object, which was an official term. And that went into the headline and, yeah, I got some, I got some pushback um, from people for, for scaremongering by using that. So, Ian. Uh, space agencies when we think of space and these big big problems and asteroids it's very very easy to think um, the european space agency nasa jaxa the russians uh, tell me a little bit about working within esa and how you are developing international cooperations right Stuart. Um ESA has been, uh, I think, from the very beginning, about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, looking into this subject uh, after uh, Rusty and, uh, started it. And, uh, and I think it was one of the subjects that uh, was uh, 
easy to work on because it catches so much the interest of researchers and people and so so back then we were mainly funding and supporting research basic research uh, what do we know about the asteroids their properties how do they behave if you if you try to interact somehow with them uh, we've learned a big deal of uh, things since then uh, the research actually we were in a workshop last week in in uh, in Maryland and I'm so amazed about how many things we've learned. So from there, this is still going on. From there, we're moving to the next step, which is setting up a real mission together, a test in space about deflection. Um, but this, in, we believe this should not be limited to a specific mission. So we're currently planning to establish an interagency planetary defense initiative. And the, the purpose of this initiative is really to federate agencies uh, to work on this problem formally, to bring it to the right level of political attention on one hand, and to establish uh, scientific working groups that uh, can report to this political uh, level and agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, I also see, uh, and here in Luxembourg, I think we are in a very special location, there's a lot of interest in industry. Mm -hmm. uh, these days and uh, agencies, the role of agencies is evolving, of course. Mm. Uh, There's one thing that I want to bring in because um, we're slightly running out of time. But this is a fascinating aspect to me and it's why we have Franz here. And this is to talk about um, asteroids from a, a legal point of view. Now, is there any legal mandate to make us defend the Earth against asteroids or what's the, what's the legal situation for this? There is only a discussion so far on general responsibility of countries to protect their population against disasters, but that's partly where the problem is. Asteroids may not recognize borders, but humanity thrives on recognizing borders, and it depends a lot on where something is supposed to be falling, which government is taking the lead, and to what extent it is supposed to help other governments. Uh, luckily, we're developing a legal framework and a legal thinking that there is this general responsibility. Um, a couple of years ago, when there was the Indian Ocean tsunami, uh, there was a rumor that NOAA, the US agency which avails itself of remote sensing pictures, had knowledge about the tsunami which could have prevented a lot of damage. And there was actually a suit brought against NOAA for failing to share that. Now, in this case, it didn't go anywhere, but it tells you that there is a growing understanding that this is a global phenomenon and probably asteroids even more than a tsunami like that, yeah. that we have to come together as an international community and overstep those boundaries. We can't get rid of them for good or for bad, but we can overstep them and international cooperation, as, as Ian is discussing, is, is the best way to do that. But we're at the beginning of that, so there's a lot of work to, to do for me and others, yes. And speculative though it is, um, if we can get this legislative, legislative framework for space, could that help in other areas as well? I guess so, yes. I mean, uh, one of the fascinating things about space is that it has triggered uh, a different dimension of looking at many terrestrial problems here. You mentioned at the beginning how, how Rusty looked at the Earth. The whole environmental movement has benefited a lot from these pictures of the Earth from outer space as this very, very fragile blue marble that we're at. And I think there's a lot of spin-off in that philosophical sense also if we actually could get our act together in this uh, context, mm -hmm. find a cooperation framework, hopefully legally supported, to tackle these issues. Mm, a great hope for all of this. So we're out of time for this particular panel, but there's plenty, plenty more to come. But for the moment, we're going over to Sabinia. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you to the panel. And it's now time to take a little trip over to sunny California and say hello to Scott Manley, who is also the host of Asteroid Day Update and also a very good supporter of Asteroid Day. Scott, how are you? I'm great. Thank you, Sabina. Good. I, I, yeah, I've been a supporter of Asteroid Day since uh, before it was formed. I mean, you probably know me from the internet for playing games on YouTube. But I actually used to work as an astronomer, and at the time, I was fascinated by the asteroid hazard. And that was, unfortunately, before I followed a great opportunity and disappeared off into tech. Mm. 
But I never lost interest in astronomy and asteroids. And my first big video on YouTube was a visualization of the discovery history of the hundreds of thousands of asteroids that are out there. And that, again, is only a small fraction of the number that are actually uh, there to be discovered. But yeah, these days I'm best known for doing science and video games. And I, I think that it turns out that people that play video games look at these big abstract problems differently to viewers of, say, TV and movies, because TV uh, games are an interactive experience, and p players are used to influencing the universe. So there's a new generation of you know, young people, scientists, that look at the world's problems and do want to do things rather than just observe. And it's kind of the way that astronomy of asteroids has also changed, that we've realized it's a bit more interactive than the passive observation that once we accepted. Hmm. Now, technological advances have brought the human race to this place where we can recognize many potential threats. And while asteroids are not the biggest problem facing us, they are the one that give us a given focus, can be predicted with amazing certainty. And beyond that, given prediction, prevention becomes a real probability. Mm. So this makes asteroid impact unique in the list of natural disasters. And as such, our understanding of this has put humanity in a position to potentially alter the destiny that nature has planned for us. So this represents what, yeah. a transformative moment for humanity as a mm. whole. And I yeah, think I, I, you, put, you, put, you really you know, put the words on the scale there. And I think it's also it's great to have you say that, because that, that's also you becoming a role model for the younger generation to get more inspired to get into the science field. I know we have really, really short time before I have to go to Stuart, but I have to ask you one question, because I know you got free tickets to a Brian oh, May yeah. concert yesterday. Did well, I got backstage tickets, yeah. Did it rock? Oh my God, it rocked. And Brian May is my absolute hero. You know, like me, he left astronomy and he came back and completed his PhD and he rocked the planet last night. And now it's all about the rocks in space. Oh, thank you for that. And thank you to both of you for, for your great support for this. Thank you, Scott. And now over to Stuart. Thank you, Sabinia. So we heard a little bit in the previous panel about how important it is to present information accurately through the media to the public. And one of the people that I have used um, relentlessly over the years to talk to me about what's happening in space is Alan Fitzsimmons. So Alan, thanks for coming back again. And you were talking to the media just the night before the Chelyabinsk meteor hit Russia, I believe, and it was quite a prophetic um, telephone conversation that you were having. Yeah, it, it was a telephone conversation. I was working at that time uh, with Richard Wainscote, who runs the PanStars uh, near-Earth asteroid search out in Hawaii, using the uh, PanStars telescope out there on, on Haleakala. And in February uh, 2013, we were expecting a predicted close flyby of a relatively large asteroid, a DA-14, that was going to occur. And so I was speaking to the BBC uh, out there, and they asked me for a few comments about uh, the future. And I said, well, you know, the important thing to realise is that we're getting progressively better and better at finding the large asteroids, the larger rocks out there, but the smaller ones, it's a matter of chance, it's a matter of luck. And so the most likely impact we can expect, and that's probably still the case today, uh, is of uh, a small asteroid exploding at altitude in the Earth's atmosphere, completely unexpected. And this was less than 24 hours before Chelyabinsk occurred in, on, uh, in February that year, yeah. In that case, we're not <laughs> going to ask you about whether another one's going to hit tomorrow. No. Um, in, what, what we're going to do instead uh, is we're going to go over to the Science Centre and talk to Natalie. Metal industry. Metal industry. Hello, hello. As you can see, I'm... I'm standing on a steel beam that was produced in the south of Luxembourg. It's kind of a symbol of Luxembourg's metal industry. And with me, I have Claude Meisch, Luxembourg's Minister of Education. And I think this Science Center connects very well the glorious past of this site with the future which lies in science and technology. You, as a Minister of Education, you have some 
supported since the beginning this uh, science center. Uh, what do you like about it? I think when um, humanity wants to solve the global problems uh, like uh, climate change and uh, if you want really to encourage uh, economic development in, in future, we all know that we need uh, more scientists, more engineers, more IT specialists. But how can we do it? How can we convince young people, children to go in this direction, to g be really interested in science and uh, technology? And uh, that's what we are doing here. We have to work with the children, with the youth, and show them that science and technology can be very exciting. And that's what the Luxembourg Science Center does. And how can this type of learning affect Luxembourg's school system? I'm deeply convinced that uh, formal education, non-formal and informal education goes hand in hand. And that's what we're doing here. This prepares the formal education. It shows that, uh, that science can be very exciting and so it creates an interest. And uh, of course we have to offer some education in our schools. We have to offer concrete education and concrete, uh, con concrete uh, apprenticeship, concrete training. That's why we are multiplying all those education offers in our schools. That's for example we we are developing a label for the schools which uh, interested and developed itself really in the domain of IT and communication, the future hubs. And we really want to open the school uh, to, be, to, to get connected to the real economic activity outside in the companies and to create something as a, a start-up feeling, a start-up mentality in schools, in these future hubs. Can you give us uh, an, an outlook of the future in science education uh, in the schools here in Luxembourg? I think really non-formal and informal and formal education has to go uh, together and uh, working with other actors, working with the companies, working with the research uh, uh, studios, working with the researchers and opening schools so that they can come in schools and show the young people, show the children and the youth uh, what, how exciting it really can be. You are organizing currently a science week. What are your personal highlights of that week? Yeah, it, it's the first time we are organizing that, uh, that week. Uh, it's uh, another activity uh, to promote the science in our schools and encourage young people to develop their interest in this domain. And what is really new is that it's opened. It's not just one activity school can offer, but we opened this, uh, this week so that a company, uh, that a scientist can offer himself his activities and uh, that schools or other, uh, other school activities or youth activities, they just can choose which activity it, uh, it uh, belongs to, to their interest and which activity is really interesting them to, to participate. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for this uh, information and back to you. Thank you, Natalie. And I currently have a guest with me here. It's Pierre-Olivier Roteval. You're head of innovation at Bill. Welcome. Thank and I'll just explain to our viewers that Bill is the oldest multi-business bank in the Grand Duchy and has also played an active role in the main stages of development of the Luxembourg economy. So, Pierre Olivier, I'd like to just ask you, why do you find representing Bill that it's important to support or sponsor a day like Astor Day? Well, as you said, uh, we are deeply rooted in the uh, Luxembourg economy and with the recent developments uh, around space tech here in Luxembourg, it's under totally natural to support Asteroid Day. Mm. And, and speaking of space initiatives that have been a lot of the discussion, how will you continue to support space initiatives in, in the Luxembourg hub, so sort of to say? Well, we have been a, a major player in the startup and econet, uh, innovative ecosystem here in mm. Luxembourg. We've been supporting companies. Uh, we help them secure uh, money to fund their future developments. So when the first space tech companies landed here in Luxembourg, uh, we found it totally natural to mm. be their partner. So um, what we want is uh, to keep on supporting uh, local economy, new space players, and we are uh, very much looking forward welcoming them here in Luxembourg. Well, thank you on behalf of Astro Day and also all the space entrepreneurs out there. We're happy to hear about that. Thank, thank you. you for joining us. And with that, over to Brian Cox on the panel. Thank you. That was quick. Thank you.